John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Well, good morning, Toe Church. My name is Pastor John. I'm excited to be with you this morning. Just real quick, if you're new here this morning, this is a, the worst the preaching will get, so come back next week. I promise it's going to be much, much better. Amen? Oh, you weren't supposed to say amen to that. Okay, <laughs> listen, I, I, have, I have a few questions I'm going to ask you guys. Would you actually answer these with an amen if you agree, okay? Um, do you trust that the Bible is the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that God, the God of the Bible, is active now? He's working now. Amen. Okay. Do you believe, even through my bumbling mouth, that God has something for you today? Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's work with those questions in mind. So I'm going to ask you one more question. Don't answer this one out loud. What is Jesus doing in your heart? Right now, what is Jesus doing in your heart? Not did what not what did Jesus do three years ago? Not what did Jesus do three months ago? But right now, what is Jesus doing in your heart? One of the best things that happened to me uh, growing up is that a youth pastor who would meet with me consistently. He took me through discipleship, and he would ask me that question. He would ask me, "What is God teaching you, John? What is uh, how is God changing you? What is Jesus doing in your heart?" And so I want to take a moment this morning to think about that question. I want to take a moment this morning to, to consider how we hear from God. Okay, how we hear from God. And in a sense, I want to demystify this. Um, we, we need to know his voice, and we need to hear his voice, and we need to be sensitive to his calling. So uh, you, some of you might be familiar with this acronym called SOAP, S-O-A-P. It's this devotional acronym, so it's scripture, observation, application, and then prayer, right? I'm going to walk through that real quick, and it's going to set us up for our text today. So first, uh, scripture. Uh, scripture, context, and text, okay? So you, you, you don't need to be a theologian to read the Bible. You don't need to th- be a theologian to understand all of the Bible. There's things to take literally. There's things to take metaphorically. There's things to hold tightly. There's things to hold loosely. And you have pastors to help you with understanding. Get a, me- uh, a mentor in your life to help you with understanding. And then this is, small groups can help you with understanding as well. So you can take God's word and you can apply wisdom to what you're learning. Okay, so that's the scripture part. The observation part, uh, it's it, a good thing to ask is what comes to mind when you're reading the text? Okay, you don't have to be this brilliant person for God to activate thoughts in your mind when you're reading his word. This is your spirit at work, right? And this is you taking your thoughts captive. Right? Some of you are familiar with that 2 Corinthians verse, take your thoughts captive. So you hold on to some thoughts when you're reading God's word and you examine them. You hold them captive and you decide, okay, this is of God. This is not of God. You get rid of the bad and you hold on to the good. And this is your spirit at work with God's spirit. In your observations, just let God infiltrate your thoughts with his word and his spirit and let him captivate your heart. This is going to help you navigate what is true and what is good and what is beautiful. Okay, number three, application. Now, uh, as Americans, uh, we, ve- we very quickly want to go to this part. Uh, I think too quickly. How does this apply to me? How can I put this into my life? What does this do for me? And I put this on the screen because I think this is helpful for us to think about. Uh, on the search for practical application, we often miss the most important tool for sanctification, namely God's heart, God's goodness, God's love. Okay, sanctification just means this growth of holiness in your life. 
okay? So we miss that when we're trying to find, okay, how do I get this to work in my life? Just get God's heart, get God's love, get God's goodness, and it's going to start to change the way you do things, change the way that you operate. And we know this verse, Romans 2, 4, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's God's heart, it's God's goodness that changes us. Okay, so now when you understand the truth, it makes its way down into your heart, at least it, it needs to. And what God does here is he sort of pours himself into you like helium into a balloon, and that balloon just kind of defies gravity and goes up. It rises up, right? That's what God does, and he rises you above your circumstances and the dissonance and the despondency and the, the hardships that come on into your life. That's what, that's what he does, and he says this. My yoke is easy and my burden is what? Light. Light. Amen. Okay, last one is prayer. Uh, so I know what they did here. I, I, I don't think we should just close things out with prayer, though. This whole acronym is prayer. Um, our, if you're in a conversation with someone, uh, say you're talking about politics, which sounds really exciting, especially in election year. Um, you're talking about politics. You don't, you don't just say, okay, I would, in the conversation, you don't just switch. Okay, now I would like to talk about sports. If you have a relationship with someone, you just go into the next thing. Okay, that's what prayer needs to be like. That's what devotion needs to be like. And I think when we just kind of try to cut things off with prayer or end it with prayer, it feels rigid to God. It doesn't feel natural to God. So I think this whole acronym should be prayer, not started with prayer, not ended with prayer, but your whole devotional time, is a, it's a conversation with God. So sometimes in a conversation, you're speaking. Sometimes in a conversation, you're listening. And when you read God's word, uh, your mind is both intaking information and it's expressing information. Okay, that conversation with God is a conversation. It's prayer. It's devotion. And listen, that's the voice of God. That's how you hear God. Now, um, if, if you're a little more charismatic, you, you might have used this term or you're used to this term. Uh, someone might say, I got a word from God, or I, I think I'm hearing something from God. And if you're, not as, if you're not in that charismatic realm, I'd like to walk you through this because I think God really does that. I think he uses our minds and his word and his spirit to point us to his heart. Um, and sometimes it's not even just a word. Sometimes it's a, a phrase. Sometimes it's a picture. Sometimes it's an image. Um, and just side note, be cautious of the language here. You're not an Old Testament prophet. You're not a New Testament apostle. We're not writing down your word in the Bible. Okay, that's, that's closed. But it doesn't mean God uh, doesn't use this and can't use it for some really, really great purposes. So let me give you a couple examples of um, it for, for me that have really been helpful to me. So... Over the past few months, God gave me this word, honor. Uh, and um, he gave me it because I think he wanted it to be on the tip of my tongue, on the kind of ends of my fingertips. He wanted me to honor those in authority over me. He wanted to honor those who have been in authority over me. And so I did a few things for my parents, for some mentors in my life, uh, and for my uh, pastor. And uh, I think God really used that. And so when I got that word, one of the things you can do is you can back it up with scripture. So I go to Exodus 20, honor your father and your mother. Okay, that's easy. Romans 13, honor those in authority over you. Okay, that's a word from God. Okay, I can back that one up. Okay, here's another one. Uh, I, I got this one. This was what I was thinking about my wife. Uh, crown. Give me the word crown. And uh, uh, there, Proverbs 12, 4 says, you know, a good wife is a crown to her husband, and so I've been calling my wife my, or my crown uh, recently. And listen, this is, this, is what, this is how God works this. He, this is how he grows me. Uh, when I proper, properly place my wife on my head, like she's at the forefront of my thoughts, uh, she's uh, at the forefront of my service, I unlock her femininity, and she's properly placed where she should be in our home. And so, so sometimes when you read God's word, it, it kind of uh, latches onto you. You might get a word or a phrase or a sentence that really locks onto you. What you need to do is stop reading and let that sit. That's God speaking to you, okay? That's hearing the voice of God. Okay, one more. 
God gave me this question. Uh, he gave me this question. He wanted me to think about what is a blessing? Uh, what is a blessing? So my grandmother called me <clears throat> on my birthday, whenever that was, like a week or two ago. And she's never called me on my birthday. Uh, she called me. She didn't say hi. She just started singing happy birthday. And then we, we talked for a little bit. And uh, she, she just gave me a blessing. She blessed me. She blessed my family. And it just felt heavier and, like, weightier than I've ever considered it. Um, and I think it's more than, uh, I hope you're happy. I hope God protects you. Uh, it felt like, this is going to sound, I think this is true. It, it felt like an impartation of power. Um, it felt like she gave me some Holy Spirit kind of power. And I think if you're going to live a life that's, a life that's listening to God's voice, uh, you're going to need moments where someone imparts some power on you. Amen. So God gave me that question. He gave me a couple of those words, and, and that, that's how I hear from God. That's, that's a way that I work through things uh, in my life. So if you want to hear from God, uh, here's another person to listen to, Oswald Chambers. This one's on the screen for you. It says, never live on memories. Let the word of God be always living and active in you. Don't live on past grace for future needs, rely on God in the present, and he'll offer you the grace needed now. I'm going to see if you guys are with me. Say now. now. Say now. now. Now spelled backwards is? <laughs> Some of you said, wow. No. It, it, it's, it's one. Say one. One. Okay, did you hear the past tense of that? So if, you're gonna, if you operate your life in the now with God, you've already won the battles that you're about to face. Okay, there's a past tense in that one. Say one. one. Look to your neighbor and say one. one. Okay, amen. So, okay, we're about to get into our text. I promise we're going to get into it. Um, today we're going to examine this famous passage uh, of Jesus flipping tables in the temple. Uh, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to move on. So here's what I want you to know. Jesus, Jesus wants your heart, okay? He wants your heart, and this text is going to show what he does when he gets it, okay, how he operates when he gets your heart. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I want to take a moment uh, and ask God for a word this morning. As, as a church body, I want each of us to do this. So I'm going to take a moment. We're going to pause, uh, just a moment of silence, let you guys pray, and then I'll pray and ask God uh, to bless our worship together. So let's take a moment and just, would you guys ask God for a word this morning? God, would you uh, protect us right now? Would you uh, honor us with your presence? You're, you're welcome uh, to work on me. God, I pray that you work on those who are listening. Father, we, uh, we want to honor you today. Uh, we ask for you to um, just blow us away with what you can do in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, so the text for this morning is Matthew 21, 12 through 17. You can go ahead and turn there now if you want. I'm going to set us up with a little bit of context here. So right before uh, this story in the temple, uh, there's the triumphal entry now. Pastor Frank already talked about this on Palm Sunday. So let me, let me give you some context. Uh, what Jesus does, he comes in on a donkey. Uh, he comes in on people's coats and on palm branches, and there's three things really that I see uh, of Jesus as he does that, as he comes in with that triumphal entry. He comes in gently, he comes in intentionally, and he comes in on your praise, okay? He comes in gently, he comes in intentionally, and he comes in on your praise. So Matthew 21 shows us that Jesus comes in humbly, he comes in slowly, he comes in at a, at a gentle pace on a donkey's colt, not an actual donkey, but like a baby donkey that's not trained yet. And he doesn't come in cantering or sprinting on a white war horse, but he comes in calmly. He enters in to serve you. And I'm going to say this phrase a couple times this morning. For his glory and for your joy. 
I think those two words are inextricable uh, when it comes to following Christ, for, your, for his glory and for your joy. Okay, so Jesus comes in gently, and then he comes in intentionally. So he created quite a stir in that region because that's where he raised Lazarus from the, te- from the dead in that adjacent town of Bethany. So he knew his return was going to be met with this kind of ruckus, this big crowds, people really excited for him to come back. And so this is a simple point, but I I want you to hear this. God has a plan, and he has a plan for you, and the only reason your plans got messy is because you're involved, okay? (laughs) I love you. I just think that's true. So trust him. If he really is God, he really does know what he's doing, okay? If he really is God, he knows what he's doing. And then number three, Jesus comes in on your praise. Uh, I did a devotional on this. I'm saying some of the things I said from that uh, and so you might be a little familiar. So Jesus came in on a donkey's colt, riding on coats and palm branches. And if you want to hear from God, uh, you need to lay your coats of comfort uh, and, and tear off the branches of the things that you think shade you from the heat. So a coat in that time uh, would have been, would have represented wealth, uh, status, and fundamentally comfort. And a branch would have protected you from the sun. It would offer a sense of life and a sense of beauty in the area you're around. And this one's on the screen. You have to give up the things that you think you need the most in order to hear from the Holy Ghost. All right, that's a little rhyme for you. You have to give up the things you think you need the most in order to hear from the Holy Ghost. This is not a great example, but I'm going to use it anyway. You get what you pay for here. Uh, There's uh, uh, earmuffs. Does anyone wear earmuffs anymore? Okay, okay. So uh, earmuffs are a good example of this because they, they provide you comfort in the winter. They warm your ears. And, but at the same time, to a certain extent, they also uh, pr- you know, prevent some hearing. All right? they, they mute some of your hearing a little bit. And not all comfort is bad, but you've you got to be aware of the hierarchy or the place it has in your heart. Right? Hebrews 12 uh, one, I was just telling my brother Jesse about this verse. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so clings closely to us. All right? If you want to run the Christian race well, you need to kill your sin and rid yourself of the things, listen, that muffle God's voice. Okay, let's read our text for this morning. That's a long intro, I know. So Matthew 21, verse 12 through 17. Matthew 21, verse 12 through 17. This is the word of our Lord. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They meaning the scribes and the chief priests. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out to the city of Bethany and lodged there. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Amen? Okay, so you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a New Testament Christian which means God is cleaning out your temple for his glory and for your joy. So let's see what he's doing in this physical temple so we can see how he operates, how he works in our spiritual temple. And so here's what I know. Verse 12, Jesus enters. Okay, this is, this is my, these are my rhyming schemes here. Okay, this is my poetry here. When Jesus enters, he becomes the center. Okay, when, when God intrudes, he sets the mood, and when God engages, he's the one that starts saving. Listen, when God comes in, he starts to drive stuff out. When God comes in, sin has to come out. And when when God captures your heart, he's going to start setting you apart, 
And when God flips the tables, he's telling you, I'm able. You don't need your stuff. You need me. And so when God comes in, it doesn't always feel good. But you got you to know that God, God is good. He's the very definition of good. He's the very concept of good. When you say something is good, what you're saying is it, it reminds me or it brings me to closer to God. That's what good is. And so let me deal with these, these money changers. Okay, so Jesus comes in, he enters in, he starts flipping these tables, and he's upset with these people that are in there. So what are these guys doing? So ta- tables and money changers, seats of pigeon sellers, let's deal with these people. So money changers, these were uh, men, they were converting money from Roman coin into temple shekels. Uh, the pigeon sellers, uh, pigeons were typically um, sacrifices for poor People, you see in Leviticus, the pigeon was a, an acceptable sacrifice, but if you were more well-to-do, you would have been sacrificing a, an ox or a sheep or something like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with making a profit, but as we'll see, we need to be cautious of the placement of our profit. And I really tried to stay just in Matthew's gospel because um, last time I preached, I went for, I think it was an hour and 14 minutes on the second service. <laughs> Because uh, I was pulling all of them in, so I'm trying to stay. But uh, in Mark 11:16, it's really interesting because Jesus flips all these tables, he flips all these chairs, and he do- it says he doesn't allow anyone to pick anything up. And I was like, what, what is going on there? Why is he doing that? And I think because um, the stuff belongs on the ground, he didn't want it to even raise something in his house meant that it had a place of significance, right? We do this in our own homes. Uh, we put up a family picture on all because it has a place of significance. We put up trophies if you're still living in the glory days, right, when you were in high school. Uh, we, we put up deer heads, right, um, if you're a psychopath, right? We do <laughs> those things. Um, I, even, even my wedding ring, it's something I carry with me, right? I, I don't necessarily pick it up, but it's something I carry with me. It's very precious to me. So we carry the things or we lift up the things that we think are very valuable. And what Jesus is saying, no, you don't pick that stuff up. That stuff stays in the ground. That stuff stays in the dirt. You can sweep it out, I guess, but you're not lifting it up in my father's house. Now, Jesus' concern here, he really lays it out when he quotes Isaiah 56, 7. This is on the screen for you. It says this, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Notice people is already plural, and then there's a S there. So it's peoples, all people, all cultures, all time. Now, Jesus uh, doesn't just tell them that it's wrong for them to buy and sell. He's really concerned about a deeper issue about what's going on there, that, namely that the temple is no longer a true house of prayer. prayer. The blessing that the temple should be to the people has been really stolen and taken and undermined. It's now a weight and a, a burden. Uh, it's a heavy yoke on the shoulder of these people that um, are the poor and those that uh, the, now the temple is inaccessible to. So the sick, the blind, the lame, the crippled, the diseased people were not let anywhere near the temple. Even a priest who might have become defiled, might have uh, gotten an accident, was no longer allowed to have access to the temple. And this was the true theft, right? Uh, that men had really defiled the house of God by turning it into a place that kept out the people that Jesus wanted to lay his hands on. And listen, Jesus wants to lay his hands on these people, the people who are broken and the people who know they're broken. These are the people that Jesus is going to lay his hands on because you're already broken, but do you know it, right? That's the question. Uh, <clears throat> this is the real crime, and so Christ was really unhappy about this, not so much that they were making uh, a few bucks on you know, changing coins out for people or selling sacrifices. Um, <clears throat> this next section I'm calling, <laughs> I call this section, normally I don't tell you guys this, but uh, this is called the slow death of convenience. I'll see if this makes sense. So things tend to die in the human conscience uh, in the name of convenience. So these men in the temple, they're providing a service, 
And I wouldn't be surprised, this isn't scripture, but just work with me here. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, their, their business started like down the street from the temple, and then a few months later, it was like right next to the temple, and then a few months later, it was like on the doorstep, and then a few months later, it was in the lobby. And, and I think what's clear is that uh, Jesus wants his temple to be a place of reverence, a place uh, that he can commune with his people. And, and we have to replicate uh, this behavior in our hearts, in our homes, and in our houses of worship. Uh, gosh. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few things off of this. So uh, I, I think we need to replicate this behavior, men, women, children, uh, men especially, uh, if you're hooked on pornography, uh, this is what's going to happen. Uh, you're, where you're filling your temple with, with uh, slimy, shifty money changers and cheap sacrifices that, sacrifices that you're offering up to the God of self. Um, you're going to operate your life in weakness. You're going to operate your life in isolation, and you're going to operate your life in confusion. That's, that's, what, that's your future if you stay hooked on it. Uh, dads, I got this word um, at like 9 p.m. on Thursday night when I was thinking this through. Uh, dads, stand up for your kids, stand up to your kids, or your kids will stand on you and the world will stand on them. Let me say it again. Dads, stay, stand, stand up for your kids, stand up to your kids, or your kids will stand on you and the world will stand on, on them. Now let me see if I can break that down. Fathers, if you don't take dominion over your house and flip the tables of the weights and the sins that come into your home, the world's going to start infiltrating your house, and it's going to undermine your God-given authority. Dads, you've got to stand up to your kids, or they're going to stand on you. Look for what's seeping into the cracks through the windows. What doors are you leaving unlocked? You have... God-given dominion over your house, it's your responsibility to take care of what goes on under your roof. And uh, I'm going to say this one. Uh, the modern-day prodigal son is a 20-year-old that lives in the basement. He plays video games. He masturbates to pornography at 3 a.m. in the morning, and he never finishes anything. And here, he's, he's, he's there physically because he's living on a false inheritance, Okay, and he won't learn anything, dads, until you flip the tables and you pull out the seat. Uh, maybe don't do this literally, but you, you remove his seat in your house. He's undermining your authority. He's undermining your dominion. He's undermining your house of prayer, and he's making it a den of robbers. Um, the temple is not a place for flippancy. The Father's house is not a place for simply material gain. It's not a stronghold for the robbers uh, in the, the prodigal sons. It's a place to have prayer with God. It's a place of passionate. The Greek word for prayer is passionate communication. Okay, it's, it's for God's glory and for your joy. Amen? Okay, you guys still with me? Okay, listen. Um, <clears throat> the, in the temple, the sacrifice became the object of concern, not the Savior. Okay, the sacrifice came, became the object of concern, not the Savior. This is a simple point. This is something that we need to examine consistently in our lives. Are your sacrifices to God getting in the way of God? Okay, or let me say it this way. Is what you're doing for God getting in the way of what God could be doing in you? Okay, this is something that I, I think we should pretty consistently look at. What's our, what's our service to God look like, and is that becoming um, maybe, maybe a crutch or um, it, what is a distraction, maybe a weight that's not bringing us, not letting us get into the presence of God? Uh, I'm calling, I don't know why I'm telling you the titles of these sections. Uh, <clears throat> this one's called the, the Misery of Luxury. Okay, so uh, chief priests and scribes, they're mad about this. They're upset, okay? They see what's going on. Jesus walks in the temple. He's walking in with authority. Uh, he's flipping tables over. And then these children are singing, and they are um, they're calling him God. And, and, the, and the chief priests and the scribes, they're, they're upset about this. And there's something about 
being in a place of comfort and in a seat of authority, and if it's not placed properly, um, it lays the groundwork for misery. Okay, chief priests and scribes are always, pretty much always throughout Scripture, upset about what Jesus is up to. And this is why Pastor Frank consistently talks about religious people. And uh, by the way, there's plenty more of that coming in Matthew. Uh, chapter 23 is going to be really interesting. But uh, it's, it, it's just a consistent thing that Scripture talks about, especially Jesus. He's really, uh, he doesn't really like re- religious people. And so that's why you hear that all the time here. Uh, so Jesus, what he does is he threatens the tables uh, where those chief priests and those scribes make their money. He threatens those seats of authority that those guys get their influence. And, and the issue is that those guys just, they don't love God. They don't realize and hear the voice of God because they're so muffled by their authority. They're so muffled by what um, the wealth that they've got, where their money comes from, uh, where their influence comes from, that they can't hear the voice of God. Of God. There is a misery that only luxury can bring. (laughs) I've said this to a few few of you. Um, If you were worried about where your next meal is coming from, you would not be worried about what your gender is. There, there, There is a misery that only luxury can bring, and you have to be aware of the potential curse that it can bring as well. Okay, so um, the, scribes and the, the yeah, scribes and the chief priests, they're concerned about what these children are saying. I think that was their biggest concern, more than Jesus walking in with authority. They already have seen him and heard that he was doing that. Uh, they're really concerned about what these children are saying. But Jesus tells us two chapters before this that childlikeness is sort of a prerequisite uh, to drawing near God, to hearing the voice of of God. Uh, Matthew 18, 3 through 4 says this, truly I say to you, unless you turn, repent, and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. However, the, the, the scribes and the chief priests, they scoff at what they're hearing uh, the children say because they're praising Jesus as God. And listen, Jesus clearly states in this text, that he thinks he's God, because he says, he quotes Psalm 8, and he says this, um, God has ordained worship for himself from the lips of children. So make no mistake, Jesus thought he was God, okay? And and the famous C.S. Lewis line is one that that I think is really helpful to hold on to. Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic, or he truly was Lord. Those are your options. So God has a plan for you, It's for his glory. It's for your joy. And when you're able to listen to him, he's able to work on your heart. He's able to uproot sin. He's able to flip these tables uh, of things that you think you really needed. And he's pulling out seats where you thought you really needed to sit. Uh, And he's saying, just just need me. Just listen to me. Just love me. And and you're going to be just fine. Amen. You guys still with me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Twice uh, Jesus quotes scripture uh, in this uh, text. So if you want to hear a word from God, uh, you need to be familiar with the voice of God. He quotes Isaiah 56, he quotes Psalm 8. And if you want to speak with power in your relationships, in your business, in your school, on your teams, with your family, you must. Know the spirit of God, and you must lay your head on the heart of God. I wonder if you could say, you must lay your heart on the head of God. But let's let's keep that for now. You must lay your heart, uh, your head on the heart of God, not uh, not just having the ability to spout verses, uh, but really having God's word and God's spirit like lodged into your being. Uh, that nothing but the Spirit of God flows out. First Chronicles 16.11 says, Seek the Lord and his power, and or it, you could say, or his presence continually. Seek the Lord and his power. The same thing, this is a parallel. Seek his power, seek his presence. 
When you do that, you're going to speak with the presence. You're going to speak with the power of Almighty God. Dads, you're going to regain dominion over your homes. Sons, you're going to regain dominion over your heart. Mamas, women, you're going to regain dominion over your hearts. Um, <clears throat> I stole this line from Tim Keller. Uh, he says, Christ is, not, or Christ is a surgeon, not a st- sergeant. Christ is a surgeon, not a sergeant. He doesn't come high, lofty, haughty, and hovering over you, waiting for you to fail. He comes in low. He comes in gently. He comes in intentionally, and he comes in on your praise. And he comes in on your praise when you trust his word and you're familiar with his work. Right, so you don't you don't go to a surgeon with a bad record. Uh, you don't go to a surgeon who you maybe interviewed and they said something that made you feel oh, this guy's a little sketchy, right? Uh, you go to one with a good record. You go to one that you can trust. And listen, uh, someone you trust, someone is someone you value, and someone you value is someone that you're going to praise. So trust God and let Him work on your heart. Trust God and let him work on your heart, and you're going to hear his voice uh, in your life. Uh, Band, you can go ahead and come up. Um, So you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, and when God comes in, he comes in like a surgeon. He begins to flip the tables, he begins to flip the chairs in your heart, uh, and he pulls the chairs of pride out from under you. But he works like a surgeon. He works slowly. He works patiently. Uh, he works lovingly. And in God's case, he works perfectly uh, to clear out the temple of your heart, to make it a true house of prayer. Because prayer is where you hear the voice of God. So what is Jesus doing in your heart? Uh, if God gave you a word this morning, I'd love for you to share it with me. Uh, I would love to hear it. That would encourage me that I didn't just come up here and say a whole bunch of stuff and not connect with anyone. Uh, so that's mostly a selfish thing. But I would love to hear it. Uh, if you need some prayer, I'd love to pray for you. Um, listen, Jesus, he loves you. Uh, let, let him go to work on your heart. Uh, he, let him in. Let him in today. Let him in tomorrow. Let him in continually. And listen, this is a challenging thing. It's a challenging thing to let God work on your heart consistently, constantly, because oftentimes it can be uh, painful. But how many of us have have avoided pain in the present and and realized that it caused more problems and more damage in the future? Right, the the process, what what Jesus is doing in our hearts, we've got to process it in the stillness and in the quiet. Um, we know in the Old Testament, God the Father, he speaks in thunder, right? But God, the Holy Spirit, he speaks in a whisper. What is he speaking to you today? What is Jesus doing in your heart? I love this hymn. Uh, it's one of my favorites called Abide With Me. I'm going to read you a couple of these lines. Just let them wash over you. Abide with me. Fast falls the evening tide. When darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, Lord, abide with me. Let's pray. Father, we're making room uh, for you this morning. Uh, We're listening to you. We are sensitive to your whisper. We're casting aside our loves for your love. Would you give us a word from your word, from your spirit? We look to you now, Father. uh, Turn over the tables in our hearts and remove our places of pride. And God, we know you're going to do this for your glory and for our joy. Amen.